Are you in Revelation chapter 1 yet? <laughs> Let's start in verse uh, number 4, and we'll go all the way to about verse 6, I believe. It says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the sevenfold or the seven spirits who are before its throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. I mean, that's a lot of rich text. I can just preach that. And the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who has uh, who loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood, and has made us. Somebody say made us. Now, last time I checked in English, has made us is a is past tense. Has made us uh, kings and priests. Somebody say has made us kings and priests. To his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I want to capture the topic and continue topically. It's a topical sermon, and I won't get into all that, but just we're going to deal with the topic of kings and priests. We've laid the foundation. We're going to deal, I want to focus today mostly on the king side. He says kings and priests. Remember, we talked about the cross depicts both. The death of Jesus depicts his priestly role, right? The forgiveness of sin, the shedding of blood. That deals with the work of priests. Remember the Old Testament, the priests dealt with the blood. But the king side not, doesn't deal with his death. The king side deals with his resurrection. It's through his resurrection was an affirmation of his kingship. He was born king as the wise men. The wise men knew that a king would be born. That's why Herod was threatened and passed an edict to kill all the children in that region because he knew a king was born. I mean, that's what Christmas is about. It, it doesn't matter what month he was born. It's, it's, it's highly unlikely that he was born in December. But at the end of the day, he was born. Hallelujah. He would have been born probably more around Passover. He probably was born more around April because it was during uh, the Passover time when he was born. But it doesn't matter. We celebrate that he was born. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody shout, he was born. He was born. So he was born a king, but the resurrection affirmed him as king. It's sort of like in coronation. He, he, the coronation of his kingship and the, it was when he was raised from the dead. The consummation of his kingship is when he returns. So he has, if you will, been crowned. His resurrection is like a crowning, a coronation of who he is, an affirmation to all mankind that this is Emmanuel, this is the son of David. It's his resurrection that gives him more authority and a greater name than any other name prior or after. His name is greater than Muhammad. His name is greater than Buddha, not just for religious reasons, but because of his resurrection. Ooh, that, that does it right there. His resurrection. So when we deal with uh, him, kings and priests, when we begin to deal with the kingly aspect, we're dealing in conjunction with the resurrection of Jesus. He rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. In Matthew chapter, I believe, 28, the last chapter, he says, uh, um, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. When did he say that? After his resurrection. He is not only the son of God, but he's also, we must understand, the son of David. Many times in our Western culture, we don't understand the Hebraic context, so we're not able to appreciate some of the things that's written in the Scripture. When he, when he says king or son of David, that is very important to a Jewish person. Matter of fact, they knew the Messiah had to be a son or a descendant of the king of David. So he came from the dynasty of kings. Amen. The dynasty of kings, which was a started for Jesus, it started with his great, 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 I believe it's 28 generations grandfather David. And through that dynasty, Jesus, through the lineage of Mary, that's why the book of Matthew captures his lineage. And it takes you all the way back to Abraham through David. So biologically, through Mary, Jesus is actually a descendant of David. He's an heir of the throne. 
So when he was born, amen, amen, he now, once, once he was raised from the dead, his affirmation of the kingdom has been established. He is the son of David. He is the king. Praise God. So when you begin to deal with this idea of the kingdom, when you deal with the kingdom in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's not talking about directly a place, even though the kingdom is a place. The kingdom of, of God, I believe, it, of course it is a place, but I believe it's in another dimension. It's, in, it's called the celestial kingdom. It, it's, it's a heavenly kingdom. It's as real, but it's in another dimension. Right? Hallelujah. So the celestial kingdom is real. But in context, when you're dealing with the gospel, the kingdom is not directly just talking about uh, a place, but it's dealing with authority. See, a kingdom deals with authority. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You could say it this way. Seek ye first the authority of God and his way of doing things. And all these things shall be added to you. So God is telling us the first thing we need to seek and understand is his authority. Many times as believers, we understand Christ. It depends on, it depends on your background, uh, your, your, your persuasion and denomination. We put great emphasis on certain things. And many times, most of our evangelical churches, we put great emphasis on the blood of Jesus. And, of, of course, we do because it's through the means of the blood that we are forgiven of sin. We must come by way of the blood. But even through the blood, there's still a motif or a, an understanding of God's authority. How many of God's word is his authority? Hallelujah. Just like the, the, the guy who just passed away, Bishop Carlton Pearson. A lot of people are showing a lot of empathy for him. I understand as a human being. But his doctrine, amen, amen, was, was a doctrine of devils. Hear me. Wasn't good. Because it, it questioned and undermined uh, the authority of God. God's authority was established in the cross. Come on, somebody. There are not many ways to God. There's only one way to God. And Christ is that authority. Amen. The Bible says in Galatians, let me, let me, let me uh, hammer on this for a moment. I didn't plan on this. The Bible says in Galatians, if any man preach another gospel, other than the gospel that I have preached, Paul, let him be accursed. It is a serious offense to be a false teacher and teach a false gospel. Amen. You know, a lot of people, you know, the devil can deceive us even through what we perceive as niceness. Let me give an example. A guy walks into a bank. And he walks in with the gun. He kicks over the, the everybody. He's he's cursing everybody out. He goes to the to the uh, uh, to the teller. Says, "Give me all the you know money, money, money." He's saying all kind of crazy stuff and disrespectful. Smacks the lady. Says, "Give me." I mean, just violent. And she puts all the money in the bag. He walks out and he, and he fires and shoots in the air and everybody falls on the ground. And they say, "Oh, what a terrible person!" And he steals the money. Another guy walks in. He smiles. He's charming. God bless you, teller. <laughs> I hate to do this to you, but give me all your money. <laughs> Just smile, everybody. This will go real easy. And he robs the bank. Which one is worse? They're both criminals. They're both bad. Matter of fact, sometimes the enemy uses that technique to deceive us. Amen. It's easy to, de to detect a bombastic person. Sometimes it's hard to discern and detect the person who deceives us with niceness. Amen. It's like in television, right? The, you have the, the, the bad witch and the good witch. They're both witches. Amen. What was that? The Wizard of Oz? It was the, the, the fairy good mother and all. You had, you had the bad witch and the good witch. Now they're both witches. Amen. Please understand that. The devil has more uh, tools in his toolbox. Praise God. Now, when we deal with the kingdom, we deal with authority. God's word is his authority. It's the final authority. And Christ uh, establishes that through his resurrection. 
when we deal with the kingly, I call it the kingly anointing, or we deal with uh, as God depicts us as kings and priests, the king's aspect or the kingdom aspect deals with authority. I'm going to go over several things that we have authority of in his name. First of all, we see the kingly has authority over demons. Now we live in a day and an age that many people uh, do not believe in the concept of demons. Now I will admit that demons are not under every situation. S some stuff you just did. Right? If you didn't put gas in your car and you ran out of gas, that ain't the devil. Man, the devil, he's after me. No, you didn't put no gas in your car. Hey, man. But in spite of that, there, there, there are demons and uh, entities and forces. The Bible says in um, Ephesians chapter 6, to put on the whole armor of God. Amen. Our battle's not with flesh and blood, but spiritual weakness in high places, principalities, rulers of darkness. Amen. So there is an unseen realm. The Bible calls Satan the prince of darkness. Darkness or hiding is his main operation of power. He hides. Sometimes he hides behind medical terms. He can hide behind certain diagnoses. Doesn't mean the diagnosis is incorrect. But many times or sometimes there's a deeper unseen force, amen, that could be attacking or afflicting someone in certain areas. And when, this, when Satan attacks or demonic spirits, they attack not only the physical body. Jesus healed a woman. Listen to the words of Jesus. Now, you can have your worldview or you can have Jesus' view. So Jesus, there was a woman that was bent over for 18 long years. And the Bible says, Jesus said this woman had a spirit of infirmity. In other words, there was an unclean and evil spirit that was bringing physical affliction to her body. That was a spirit of infirmity. Does that mean every sickness, every, every affliction is the devil or demon? Not necessarily. But there can be many times a demonic entity that's attacking you. Not only in the physical realm, but also in the soulish, which deals with the mind, the will, and the emotions. I believe in America, more so than ever before, America has, is being attacked mentally by demonic spirits. That doesn't mean if someone is being attacked by a demonic spirit that they are possessed. Possession is an extreme, and that can happen. Uh, I, I'll speak to that in a moment. But the Bible talks about how Jesus came to heal all that were oppressed of the devil. Many times a mental oppression Many times it's an unclean or demonic spirit that's attacking a believer and some, an unbeliever as well as sometimes a believer. Talk to me. And not only in the mental realm, he can attack you in the emotional realm. In all these places, the enemy, demonic powers, entities, forces, unseen forces can attack us and come after us. Sometimes uh, simply just um, through weakness, sometimes through trauma, sometimes through abuse. Amen. The person that received the abuse also can be open and triggered by demonic spirits. We think of the abuser being demonic, but many times if we don't get healed and get delivered, those areas can fester and become demonic. Doesn't mean you're not saved. It doesn't mean you're that, you're that you're completely dysfunctional. It's just in that area there's a stronghold. Are y'all getting this? Praise God. I mean, if we just try, I won't over-practicalize uh, over it. I just made up a word, but I'm going to go with it. It sounded good. I, I'm going to over-practicalize this. But even in the natural, even, I talked about this before, in the medical field, in the scientific field, uh, even the subatomic level, the, 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 the uh, things are smaller than an atom. They're still discovering. They don't have it all figured out. So how much more of the unseen realm, the realm of the spirit? The Bible says the things that are seen created the, thing, the uh, things that are unseen. In other words, the unseen, I said it wrong, the unseen created that which is seen. So God is unseen. God is spirit. You can't pick up God in a telescope. You can't find God in a microscope. Amen. Amen. Because he's spirit. 
God is spirit. And those that worship God must worship him what? In spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. So there's a spirit realm. And it's through the name of Jesus and the authority of the kingdom of God that when we use his name to cast out devils, dispel and break strongholds, we're operating as a king. The kingly anointing has come in Christ to break the power of the devil. Again, everything is not the devil. But more things than not than we actually subscribe to is demonic. It depends on your point of view. Let me explain that to you. When Jesus came on the scene, the worldview of Israel at the time of the religious leaders was they didn't believe in the demonic. It was the common poor people the common people that subscribe to that theology and that understanding of the day. That's why they weren't able to receive the ministry of Jesus, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Matter of fact, the Sadducees didn't even believe in the resurrection. The the Sadducees didn't even believe in the supernatural. But yet they were the religious people. Sounds like a lot of church today. See, these mindsets continue. They're passed down from generation to generation. They just put new tags on them. Same mental perspective about it. It hasn't changed. You still see the Sadducean mentality today in the Christian church. Come on, talk to me. Now, Pharisees, opposite of Sadducees, believed in angels in the, in, and also the unseen realm, but they didn't believe in the application of it. So they would sound like modern Christians would be like, well, I believe God can do miracles. Oh, I, I do believe, you know, maybe somebody could, it could be demonic. But you know, that's kind of an outlier. But Jesus made it the center of his ministry. It wasn't an outlier. It was a mainstay. And through the power of the Holy Ghost, that's why his ministry was so different from the people of his time. He was not a secularist. He moved in the power of the Spirit. He wasn't a politician. He moved in the power of the Spirit. Come on, somebody. He cast out devils and healed the sick. Hallelujah. He boggled the mind of the secularists. He boggled the mind of the religious leader. They could not understand. They would ask, by what authority does he do these things? Notice they even recognized when he cast out devils and healed the sick, even though they disputed him, they still associated to authority. By what authority does he do these things? Jesus said, it is not I that doeth the work, but my Father that sent me. Do I have any sent people in this place today? The gospel, if you read it purely through the word of God, is exclusive. It's different from any other message, uh, any other application under the sun. The gospel is backed by the kingdom of God, the authority which was established in the cross and resurrection of Jesus. Remember, our leader, the the son of God, is a resurrected man. He's not ordinary, so why would your gospel be ordinary? He's not plain or regular, even though he meets us plainly and regularly. But he's on another level. So the Holy Spirit has been given, I'm ahead of myself, to empower us to do the works of Christ. Yes, we are to love. That's the foundation. And forgive. We're to operate as priests and be forgiving and loving and and, and preach the gospel and share the gospel for the remission of sin. But also we share the anointing of a kingly one where we're able to pray for the sick and cast out devils and bring deliverance along with the gospel. The gospel is a message from heaven ordained by God. Hallelujah. Given to men and women to exercise his authority in the earth. Praise God that men may repent and be delivered of their sin. Turn to Jesus and be born again. And experience eternal life and the fruit of the spirit. Love, peace, joy, happiness. Come on, talk to me. Hallelujah. Are y'all getting this today? So Jesus, you got to go to his ministry. So Jesus, in his earthly ministry, what he would do? He said, go preach the kingdom 
And when they would preach the kingdom, they would do at least two things, if not more. But there were two things that was consistent when they would preach the kingdom. In other words, he said, go and preach and demonstrate the authority of God. And they would go and they would preach, number one. And then the two other things that went with it, heal the sick and cast out devils. See, we think of devils, we think of the exorcists. We think of, we think of these extreme movies. Many times they're just entities and forces, if, if you want to use the word energies, that come against the mind and the emotions of people. And it's through the power of the cross, through the anointing of the Spirit, that these things can be dispelled and broken. That's why I tell people, if you truly have been taught like you're being taught here, voodoo ain't got nothing on you. Christians who are washed by the blood and understand their authority in Christ, there is no voodoo doll or no spell that can stick to me. There's no witch, no cantation, or nothing that can stick against me. But great is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Even the unseen realm, there's a name that's greater than every name. The Bible says that Jesus has a name, amen, of all things seen and unseen. That means even demons know his name. That means even witches know his name. Hallelujah. Voodoo doctors know his name. That's why they stay away from him. Because he is the son of God. He is the son of David. He is the legal king and the rulers of the kings of the earth, according to Revelation 1 and 5. So we need a revelation of the cross, not only the forgiveness of sin. Yes, that's the means. That's the entrance point. But we also need a revelation of who we are in Christ and understanding the work of the Spirit to bring deliverance. It's called the messianic work of Christ. We are to do messianic work. Amen. Jesus' view was so clear. Open your Bibles to Luke 10, 17 through 20. Luke 10, 17 through 20. The Bible says, Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. These were not big, elaborate exorcists. You know, the guy comes in with the collar and the big old wooden cross. Hey, man, sometimes you got to tell the truth. It may offend people, but sometimes you got you to gotta tell it like it is so they can see it. You ever notice something that even deep down they know it doesn't work like that? Because he always gets thrown through the window anyway. You ever notice that? He comes in with the big old cross and the holy water, and he ends up getting thrown out the window. Because they know there's no power in that. Hallelujah. But when you operate in the power of the Spirit, praise God. Turn to somebody and say, just listen and learn. You know, there, there was a lady who sent something to me when we traveled. And she said, Apostle, I thank God that you challenged me. Yeah. See, I've noticed in this generation, very few people can discern the difference between being challenged or offended. Yeah. Yeah. Just because you being challenged doesn't mean you got to be offended. Yeah. Just take the challenge. Yeah. So entitled. And you know, and especially when you know the persons tell the truth and you're still offended. Come on, somebody. God will challenge us. Why? He challenges us with some of our thinking that we may repent. Or let me say an easier word, a, more, a word you understand, that you can reconsider. Well, let me, let me, oh, you know, I never thought of it that way. Let me reconsider that. Amen. Praise God. Then he says, even the demons are subject to us in your name. He said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, he's not referring to some pre-Adamic situation. Now, there's, there's a the theology that teaches that Jesus is making reference to a time before time when Satan was cast out of heaven. 
right? That actually happened, but in this text or context, that's not what he's referring to. When you look at the tense of the verb, he's talking about what was happening at the moment. He sent his disciples into a certain region. They're preaching and casting out devils. And every time they're preaching and casting out devils and they're demonstrating the kingdom of God, they come back to Jesus and Jesus said, as y'all were going, I saw Satan falling. I saw the power of that region. I saw the demonic force that's been running that region. As you went forth in the, in the power of the kingdom, I saw him coming down like lightning. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody give Jesus praise. 